We've been here um, 12 years. It's been a long time. I remember when we first moved here and the bus stop was down at the corner. These parents would not just send their kids down to the corner. They drove down so you had a row of cars and then they would let them out and they'd get on the bus. It, it made me Thank you. These parents really, really cared. He used to list his hometown some... Padre Island. So he would put Padre Island on, on stuff as his hometown. That was Jesse. He wanted to go to KU, but we told him that's so expensive, it's out of state. And uh, I, well, I'd say the words, but I said, you'll get lost there. You know, UMKC is close by, and I said, that would be a good place to start and everything. So I think that's, um, we kind of talked him into it. I was a partner in a law firm. I, I gained a lot of weight, lost hair, stressed out. So I went ahead and resigned my partnership. Um, and then six started at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Hey, we have a Model UN program, and you've even done a little international law. Would you be interested in doing Model UN? My thought was, well, that's fine. I don't know if it was a flyer or it was something on social media, but they were having a Model UN meeting over at near UMKC, and I thought, you know, why not? I was a graduate student at UMKC in social work. I'd heard about the Model United Nations. I ran for president of the UMKC chapter and was elected to be president of the chapter. So that was my responsibility in the 2006 conference in Chicago. We went to the same high school and we had mutual friends, so that kind of made us friends also. I don't think I saw him much over that summer. And then he decided to do this um, Molly Wing. Jesse and Ralph asked to be on the Historical Security Council. They were friends, and so I said yes. Model UN is a simulation of the United Nations, and different schools take on the roles of different countries to debate and to resolve um, issues. 
first thing that I was warned about was, well, yeah, we had an incident the previous year. One of the girls was so drunk, she couldn't get into her room, and they found her at 6 a.m. sleeping out in the hallway unattended. And I met with them and said, okay, this is the way I'm going to run the program. I mean, ultimately, I, I have to, in hindsight, say I did not succeed riding that ship quick enough. Jesse had volunteered to go to Chicago through UMKC for the Model UN conference that they were going to have. He came around, I don't know, sometime close to five and just called on the door and said, hey, Dad. I opened my eyes and I saw him and I said, okay. So I got out of bed and got dressed and uh, went in the living room and just ate a real quick breakfast. Just had a bowl of cereal. Nobody's ham and eggs, that kind of stuff. Then we went out, he loaded his stuff up, and we got in the SUV, and we drove. In November, it was damp, and it's kind of dark and chilly out. Uh, it's difficult to get into detail. I don't know the details. I know them, but they're not really accessible. He was just excited and thrilled, and he, as always, was twisting the knob on the radio. He would get a song, and he would let it play through. Oh, Dad, you're going to like this one. You like this one, you know. I'm driving him there, and I'm kind of sleepy and stuff, so I'm trying to concentrate and go take Jesse, drop him off, say goodbye, come home, and then go back to bed. If I had known what was coming, then there's things you want to say and everything, but it's just, you know, you made an assumption, you assumed that you would see that person again. And we kind of wove around through these little streets. And we came to a little bitty parking lot. It was just an opening and I just kind of stopped and Jesse got out, got all these bags and everything out. In the parking lot, there was a pickup and there was a young man standing there. And I think it was Ralph. They were really close and really seemed to be excited. So I drove to the end of the parking lot and come back around. I looked out the window, I saw Jesse standing there. Jesse was waving his arms and talking and stuff. I caught his eye and we waved to each other. And then I pulled out of that parking lot. And that's the last time that I saw Jesse. We couldn't afford the plane tickets and the train would not have gotten us in late. So they booked vans. People slapped, people chatted. I was making like 22 credit hours that semester and I could see those probably. Now we were in different vans. We would uh, communicate by text message or phone. We were heading up there, we were having a great time, just just talking about uh, what we were going to do when we got there. We were ready to like just kind of go out and have fun. Jesse sat right behind me in the van, so I got to actually kind of chat with him and just a couple of the other students, and um, really got along really well.
we rolled in Saturday night. We got over and got the conference started. For the most part, we had a good time. I mean, got to be uh, Monday night, and that's really when it went bad. On Tuesday morning, I had to get everybody checked out of that hotel by noon. We stayed at the Four Points, which was a satellite Sheridan branch that was north of the conference hotel. I had already head counted everybody, so I said, okay, where in the hell is Jesse? We gotta go, we only got like 10 more minutes. Well, he's not there. I don't know where he is. Well, where's his stuff? Oh, it's all sitting up there. We got up there. Jesse's crap's everywhere. Basically, I'm like, just start grabbing clothes and throwing them in the bag. There was a gallon jug of vodka and the jug was empty. And I guess they had been nipping on that for about four days. So I figured Jesse was just sleeping it off and had just crapped out in somebody's room and we hadn't connected. I just told the kids, let me deal with it. We got a brief sessions in the afternoon, and then we hit the vans. Because when you're driving back from Chicago, you're looking at a solid 10-hour drive. Derek was saying, don't worry about it. I'll find him. You guys are good. We get over to the main hotel. At that point, he wasn't around. By about 1.30, I'm just, I'm starting to get really nervous. So I go ahead and I contact hotel security and say, look, I think I might have a missing student. I went ahead and I pulled Ralph and I said, okay, go get all the other kids. Find out where Jesse is. At about 2.30, Ralph comes back to me and goes, look, Nobody's seen him. I basically said, okay, we're done. And I went to the Chicago PD. And I walked in and, I mean, I, how, do you, how do you look at the police department and say, I can't find a kid? I sat at the front door of the Sheridan Hotel, and I mean, I can even visually remember exactly where I stood. And I got Mr. Ross's phone number, and I called him, and he answered. And I, 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 it's, it's almost surreal. All I could say to him was, Mr. Ross, my name is Derek Moorhead. I'm with UMKC. I'm here in Chicago. I can't find Jesse. I, I was kind of kicking into defense mode at this point. My only instinct was to get the remaining 12 kids home. They were visibly shaken. Like, the moves have kind of changed. Ralph was, I couldn't tell what he was thinking, but I think he did a really good job putting on a brave face. I don't remember really talking about Jesse. I think we were all in shock. I sent them home. Joe drove one van. Ralph drove the other van. 
I was going to stay in Chicago until I found Jesse. He was at uh, the scout camp. We get a call, and I pick the phone up, and it's Jesse, and he's just practically hysterical. And he just was raving. I couldn't quite get it. And everything was okay, but Jesse had apparently gone out and had gone swimming, and he hadn't put the sunblock on. He had great little huge blisters all on both his shoulders. I said, just go ahead, and I said, you have fun. And he did, and he enjoyed it. Jesse was a pill. I know you missed your brother once you give him a hug. Sometime in the afternoon, we should have been getting a call from him letting us know when they were leaving and coming home. Probably close to three o'clock, the phone did ring and when it rang, I was kind of bleary and uh, hadn't really been asleep that long. And then uh, it kind of, I think it dawned on me that Jesse was supposed to be calling. So I picked the phone up and it was this, the uh, sponsor. And that, they just woke me up and I wasn't completely awake. And then when they started talking about, they were getting ready to leave and they didn't know where Jesse was and they were looking for him. And, and they, I believe he said that, once I know more, I'll call you back. I went outside for a while and stood in the driveway, and Jesse's car was out there, and it was full of uh, Coke cups and burger wrappers and stuff. So I got a big trash bag and started cleaning all the trash out of it. Figured, well, you know, when he gets home, it'll be, it'll be ready for him. And, Right then, it just hit me that this was reality. Jesse was somewhere and no one knew where. Well, I don't remember when we got the first phone call from yeah. police. You called them. I talked to a couple of detectives. There was even an undercover officer. He said he was currently out on the streets. He wanted to know what Jesse was wearing. I don't know, I don't even remember how I told him that because at the time I didn't know what Jesse was wearing. I could describe Jesse as glasses and freckles and red hair, very tall and slim and fair. I'm not quite sure where, but I was able to find uh, listings of sites that Jesse had joined and so I tried signing on to sites that he was had been on and looking for any current messages or anything, and everything was all over. Just grasping at straws. Don called me and said that they wanted me to be up to speed and around. The instant response was, we'll be right down in 30 minutes with a pizza. It's either natural or it's out of a, a feeling of impotence that you can't do anything. You try to do what you can. And so bringing, bringing pizza was what we could do. But that first day, it was mostly just pizza and just listening and holding each other and, you know, tears, tears, um, as to what might be and what could be. We talked with the sponsor, and he said that uh, one of the older students, he would be bringing Jesse's suitcase home. He came to the house, and uh, we knew it was very hard for him. I mean, how, how do you 
come to a family that has a missing student and say, oh, here's his stuff. I wanted to get Jesse's stuff to his parents, so that's what I did. In the bag, it was just uh, a bunch of uh, clothes, rumpled clothes, I remember. You know, like his wallet and his phone. I'm sure he had on him. They weren't in his suitcase. No, we didn't see anything. Me, I'm a good mom. What do I do? I take everything and I washed it up, put it away. That's what moms do. My instincts indicated that the next 12 to 24 hours is going to be crucial. What if he was injured? What if, like, he got mugged? You know, maybe he was propped up against something. It was cold. I'd look for him. So what I did was I spent the next 12 hours in those areas. I walked every conventional route to and from the four points. I was looking in trash dumpsters. I was looking in alleys. Um, there was a building under construction on the east side of the hotel. It was like a parking garage. And um, I didn't see anything. Seven thirty in the morning, I go downstairs. I'm interviewed again by the detective who's there. The dive teams were there. They swept the river. He said, we always have one or two suicides, people jumping off the bridges. When people commit suicide in this river, we find them within five feet of the entry point, always. They didn't find Jesse, they didn't find his cell phone, they didn't find his wallet, they found nothing. They said, he did not go into this water. He said, we can guarantee it. After I finished up with them, I was tapping out. I had contacted the Rosses again. They had expressed that they were going to come up. I asked the detective, and he pretty much said, look, Derek, you know, unless you can come up with anything else, I, he goes, I don't know what you can do. So Wednesday afternoon, I flew out of Midway and came home. There's a flea market, big flea market down in Harrisonville that we used to go to a lot. So we said, we'll go over there and kind of tried to have some semblance of normal. Well, reality was too horrible to face. It's like being in the water and trying to keep your head above the water. You keep sinking down into this terrible thing that's going on and you're just lost in it, but you, then you try to get yourself back to norm, to the normal you remember. You want everything to go back. You want somehow to find a way to make it go back to the way it was. But you just keep going back and forth. And I know I just, I, I kind of about reached the end of my rope. And then my cell phone rang, her cell phone rang. There were news people and they explained that they were here at the house out front. Said there's five of us, we'll each take a turn interviewing with you and ask you questions and stuff. So we did all five of them. And we weren't thinking about TV, we were lost in hoping Jesse would show up. And then it's horrible when that screen is your son's face missing in Chicago.
I was in law enforcement uh, 33 years. A lot of guys will say they had a lot of bad days. So I look at it as good days and bad moments. The old saying, the hands are dealt. Well, in this case, we were dealt uh, one guard, and that was that police report. So it wasn't even a hand you could begin to play. It was probably, I think, the Friday after Thanksgiving before we actually could eliminate Jesse being left in one of the, one hotel or the other. But that was still three days. There was a considerable physical search. Every dumpster and behind every pillar, and, and then it just fails off, and there's nothing. Once we found out there was 1,200 students, and having them all left town with the exception of Jesse Ross, not knowing who was critical to this investigation and who wasn't, and where do we begin? We had a lot of people, students that didn't respond or told they weren't making a statement. To get this case, and to get it the way we were given it, where do we go? Investigators like came and talked to us multiple times. We didn't want to get anyone in trouble. How much could we say to help the investigation without like hurting anyone that we cared about? For ourselves for them there. Every day that passed, we kind of started to tell ourselves, like, oh, this will pass. He'll show up. There was a terrible problem with the weather. It was just socked in with, with the blizzard. So we had to sit and we had to wait until around December 10th, we were able to go up with our deacon from church. I felt very seriously like I was there to protect the Ross family. We handed out uh, flyers to the men and women who, you know, homeless. If you're Simon and Garfunkel, places where only ragged people know. I went up and down the Michigan Avenue and the homeless people were sitting out and I actually gave them money and I gave them the the flyer and I said, Would you go eat a meal on me and talk to your friends, see if anyone has seen this boy, this is my son. You knew he was in these places and you would go to these places and he's not there. So sure that we would see something or we would see him and then you're, you're there and then you're getting ready to go home and it's, it's like, how can it be that we can be where he was and yet there's absolutely nothing there, nothing at all? Detective Rizzo called me <clears throat> as we were near the sheriff handing out flyers. And he said, I want to let you know that 
there's been a body discovered. We don't know anything about it. As soon as the media catches wind of this, they're going to be at the Sheraton, get the Rosses upstairs to their room. And so I did. One of the networks, they published a, a little notice saying that Jesse's body had been found. They found out it was someone else, and he had a note and everything on him. It was some other poor family, you know, finding their body. I was standing in the lobby of the hotel, and Christmas was coming. All these families had their kids, and they were all little kids laughing and running around, and just everybody in a holiday mood. And it, it made you realize, for us, you know, it, the world had just suddenly stopped. But here's all these people, and it, they don't know anything. They're just going on just like it's any other day. Uh, in in your life, you know, and it was it. Things are not going to stop for us. We're not the center of the universe. When I was a kid, uh, I wanted to be an archaeologist because I enjoyed digging stuff up. The small town that I grew up in had burned down towards the turn of the century. Rather than trying to go through everything, they just kind of dumped it in this creek. When I was 10 years old, I discovered this creek and uh, spent a lot of time there. Unfortunately, with my line of work, a lot of times you're dealing with people at a bad time in their life. The resolution that comes about is rarely the good kind. The first time I'd heard of their case um, was in June of 2007. I was traveling when they called, and uh, it was Mr. Ross. I spoke to him on the phone for quite a while and uh, started working on the case and seeing what I could find out. And There were a 1,000 kids at the uh, UN convention. We were able to find a lot of witnesses, talk to several. Um, some didn't want to talk. Um, and I just dove right into it. The morning before he disappeared, uh, we had about four or five hours of free time. We kind of walked through Chicago, uh, did a couple of places. We went to a Harley Davidson store, Hard Rock Cafe, the Maple Pier. It was me, him and another girl, uh, her name was <laughs> From there, we went back to the hotel. And I think that's when we had another meeting. The last time that I saw Jesse, we had finished the evening session, which ended at 9 p.m. or 9.30. And I remember seeing him after that session. And I don't remember what we said. It was just brief contact as we were passing. He seemed fine. Jesse and his teammate, Ralph Parker, they both knew that they were to report to the meeting rooms to be part of the Security Council. 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. 
Monday night, there would have been the dance and party, which I did not attend. Joe hung out with me. The kids said they were going to bed. They didn't want to go to the dance because we weren't staying at the hotel where the dance was. So Joe and I went to Chili's because we figured, well, we'll stay for an hour or two, go grab something to eat, and then we'll go, we'll go, go to bed. While we were gone, these guys turned right around and went to that damn dance. If I would have known that, I'd have been at the dance. That's where things got out of hand. That's what created all this. Where most of us knew kind of where the lines were drawn. Jesse knew where they were drawn, but they were a little bit broader for him. So he might push just a little beyond that. He just, a little pill, and he would usually end up doing something that would get him in a spot, and then he couldn't understand why he was in that spot. Usually, if you sit down with Jesse and you could talk to him and explain things, he would understand what he had done, and he learned his lessons. Uh, we went to the parents' night. I forget what grade that was, but we are talking to the teacher, and she said, yeah, Jesse's not really working at his work like he needs to. And we said, well, everything he brings home, we said he's... He's got A's and B's. I said, it really looks good. And she goes back and she goes to his little desk. It's crammed full of papers. If he didn't get a B or A or B on it, he wadded it up and jammed it under his desk and didn't bring it home. You know, Mom and Dad want to see A's and B's, so I'm going to bring them A's and B's. We were hanging out in someone's room and drinking. We were all under age. I'm not sure how we even got our hands on alcohol. I think we were drinking for like an hour or two. After we all hung out, we decided to walk to the hotel where the conference was being held because there was a party because it was the last night of the conference. We all walked separately. I remember taking pictures of that party and Jesse was in those pictures. I don't think anything seemed out of the ordinary. I think we were all having like a lot of fun. I don't remember him at least seeing what seeing me like he was like down or upset or anything. Like he just seemed like he was having a good time. Obviously we were all intoxicated. I guess about an hour or so, about 40 minutes or so, I didn't see him. He went upstairs, I remember, and he was with people from uh, the community college.
They opened up the doors at night as a hospitality suite, and they knowingly gave out call to minors and other students from other schools. And Jesse drank in that room before he went down to his security council meeting. I think we got started at 2.30, I think it was. He came in at about a little after. You know, he was in there for 30, 20 minutes or so. He'd been drinking, but he was coherent. I mean, we were all really competent in what we were doing at the time, but yeah, he didn't seem like he was having trouble walking, you know? I think I, I remember him being having to be helped when he was trying to walk. Um, but I didn't see him too much. When we sat down, he, said, he whispered something to me and I couldn't hear it. And then, uh, and he ended up walking out at about 2.50. I remember seeing him, him leave and going out, I think it was to my back and left. Uh, it was a very narrow area. He didn't run into anything, stumble across anything. I assumed he was going to go back wherever he was, upstairs, or maybe back to the hotel to sleep. And that's the last guy I saw him. thousands of kids down there, thousands of them there for that convention, and uh, one, one is what taken. What did Jesse do different? Yeah. If Jesse did something stupid and caused his own problem, he, he wasn't bad, he just was prone to poor judgment once in a while. When we talked about getting a card, and he wanted a street racer. I bought him an economical car with a five-speed transmission. I taught him how to drive stick shift. He didn't know how. We did a little driving around and stuff several times. I took him one time, and we're coming back home, and we're coming around the corner, and there's an intersection and a red light, and Jesse's not slowing down. And I said, slow down, Jesse. And he didn't do anything. I said, Jesse, slow down. And he didn't do anything. I said slow down really loud and suddenly he hit the brake and stuff and we stopped. I think he just froze up. You're not going to tell mom, are you? I said, no, I'm not going to tell mom. I said, don't ever do that again. I always wonder if that couldn't have been a reason that he had problems because he got a little overconfident in the big city and thought he knew what he was the only thing we had going was the, uh, the hotel uh, videos. We had them on video leaving the four points. His intended destination was the Sheridan. He arrived there. The last video we had of Jesse was outside in the uh, service drive, the Sheridan. But once he went back in the hotel, there was no more video. Jesse's cell phone. 
there was a signal at about 3 or 3.30. After that, there was nothing. But we felt that uh, Jesse probably found himself outside that hotel. And the condition we believe he was in, more than likely, he could have easily fell into or slipped into the Chicago River, which was only a matter of 25 feet or something from the, the back door. Given the time of the year and the temperature, generally someone that falls into the river at that spot, the water's colder, they tend to go straight down and remain there without movement. I expected that Jesse had gone into the river for a marine unit to find Jesse with probably within 10 or 20 feet of that hotel. When they didn't, usually they go up river. And the searches there went entirely up the river. There was nothing found. I suspected the locks. We determined that those locks had been open, I want to say like 7.30 that morning for an hour. And once that happens, that the whole Lake Michigan uh, to look into. big city and um, a lot of weird things happen here. I was educated as a naval architect, which is a ship designer. My whole career has been either on board ship or in some way related to the marine industry. And then I now am the uh, lock maintenance engineer for the Chicago Harbor Lock. If you go back into the uh, late 1800s, all of their sewage was being dumped into the river and it flowed out into the lake. And then they would suck water from the lake as drinking water. So that was a serious problem. And the solution they came up with was to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. One of our main purposes is to regulate the flow and the amount of water that is lost from the lake. The water, because of the operation of a lock, it always is flowing downriver towards the city, not away from the city. The only time we see flow that comes from the river towards us and into the lake are during an actual flood where we've had to open the gates. In 2006, uh, there was no such flood event. Things do get pulled along by towboats and barges, and there's ways that, you know, a body could be maybe uh, stuck between the towboat and the barge. We pulled up the records, and uh, we didn't find anything uh, like that that went through that during that period. and. There was uh, only two vessels that went through. One was a small passenger ferry, the Bravo, I believe. I know the type of vessel it is, fairly streamlined. Um, I mean, I, I think it's very unlikely. The distance from that hotel through the, uh, the opening for the Lakeshore Drive Bridge close to a half a mile. That's a long way to be uh, dragged along by, by a, a vessel of that type, I think. In my feeling, what the police proposed is would be very difficult to occur. I think uh, if you saw the flow of the river and uh, the 
of where we're located, it would be uh, nearly impossible. And I don't think the police's answer in this case uh, really seems to work. Nobody had a clue what to do with this situation. They told us uh, that when Jesse left this conference room, they said he would have been facing these glass doors that go out by the river. So he would have just automatically gone right out those glass doors, and then he would have been right by the riverbank. They said it had been real easy for him to fall in. That's not true at all. You come out into a hallway, and then you go around to another hallway, and then you have to go down an escalator to get to those glass doors. With all the cameras in that city, they can't place him anywhere along the route back to these other hotel. There's no sign of him ever leaving that hotel at all. There were blind spots, but uh, we went over it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times in just any event we might have missed something, and not once did we see Jesse Ross. There was a security officer there that sat down with me for over two hours and we watched videotape. This long corridor on the side of those central conference rooms, that had no camera. The ca only camera was from the escalator looking east. It was lit and on the entire time. Nobody walked out one of those doors. There's one other exit in that little hallway that ran along their little conference room, there is an, a little known exit. And the moment you walk through this little door, there's an immediate staircase. And it climbed literally all the way to where the valley parking was. And I mentioned it to Ralph. Ralph said, oh, yeah, I guess I should have told you about that. That's how Jesse and I typically left the room. Like those doors that were back there, I, I was surprised because I didn't know about those doors until he walked out of them. There was a, a back exit. Um, I remember him going, I think it was through that door. I mean, it makes sense it was a pain in the neck to walk all the way around all these conference rooms and walk all the way around and then go up several flights of escalators. They could just take, you know, 20 feet out of the door. They're already going up a flight of stairs and right at the front door of the entire hotel. He's heading away from the river, but that's how we walk back to get to the hotel. So everybody walked down that path. Now, from the camera, where the camera posi main camera position is, it's well lit. The camera is facing east, which captures anybody coming in. It does not capture the exit that Jesse and Ralph always took. And it was pitch black over there. I looked at it from seven different angles. I even had the security guard go back and we watched that footage. You could have come and gone out of that and because of the shading, no lighting, no cameras, that's the way Jesse left the hotel. He loved music. I, I just uh, think it was a way to express himself or uh, loud. When he got to work interning at the radio station, he really got into the music then. The entertainment 
uh, industry had its appeal. The music, he really felt it deeply. I think it was important to him. Before he went to Chicago, he had gotten him a second job in a voiceover internet place, and <clears throat> and then he was due to become a full-time employee at the radio station. That was his plan. He was wanting to move to New York City. That would be Jesse. He's going to go off to New York City, doesn't know anybody, doesn't have a job waiting for him. And we said, you know, you've got to get yourself together and you've got to get back in the program and so on. And he was feeling kind of picked on. He was just feeling really pushed around and went out the front door and drove off. I didn't want him leaving in that state. And then he was fine. He just, there was a real heart there. Just like I remember one time I had had a bad day at work or something, and then he came up into the break room and he had flowers for me. This Model UN in Chicago, um, we didn't know much about it. In 2005, he had lost my video camera. But he told me maybe it was 1, 1 a.m. or something, and he crossing a park or something, and some guy with a knife took the camera away from him. Of course, in Chicago, it comes along, and Donna didn't want him flashing a lot of cash around him. He's telling her, oh, you're not the one that's got a knife stuck in your face, and I know to be careful and all of this. So, so apparently he thought he was being careful. Found out he had about $400 in cash. I know he had a lot of 20s, because he opened up his wallet, and it's like, it was fairly thick of, of cash. I didn't think anything about it being that dangerous. Knowing Jesse, my guess is that he had something else going on. And he stayed for half the meeting, and then he decided he was going to take care of something else. Jesse had brought several mix CDs that he had put together. He said, I would love to meet somebody up in Chicago and show them. He goes, I would actually like to start doing raves and doing DJ work. When I checked Jesse's room, other than Ralph putting a few clothes in the suitcase, I was the only one running through his room. His wallet was gone. His cell phone charger was there. All his major clothes, except for what he had on that night that he, when he changed, the CDs were not there. Those CDs, I never saw those CDs. And I mean, he talked about them that whole weekend. So... He took those CDs with him to wherever he went. But he never mentioned anything like that to me, and I figured that he would have. I had no idea where he was going. But him walking out was, was no surprise. And that you'll be all right by yourself, I believe. He said that during that day, or maybe the day before, which would kind of imply that he might have been fainting to leave. Uh, maybe he had left to go to this party or whatever else, maybe it was gonna end. Uh, raves typically go all night. Maybe he was gonna go during the break and go to the party and then come back to the hotel and be there in time to, to leave or whatever. 
I've been unable to confirm that there was a rave that night in the city. A lot of speculation and a lot of, you know, people thinking that maybe he uh, wanted to go and be a DJ and live on his own and, and work for cash and, uh, uh, you know, and, and anything is possible. Um, anything is possible. But that seems highly unlikely. And if you were, why would you stick around for the whole uh, convention? Why, you know, why would you just leave right away? Those personal identifiers, if you use any of those personal identifiers, um, you know, your name in combination with your date of birth, uh, your social security number, anything like that, and those things can be traced back to you. And uh, the fact that it's been so long now, the more and more unlikely that seems. Some items had been pulled from his bathroom and submitted for fingerprints. And they could get some of his fingerprints on file that way if, say, for instance, he was living under an assumed name and he was arrested five, ten years later, his fingerprints would be in the NCIC. And when they ran his fingerprints, they would find him, know who he was. Um, but I don't believe they ever processed the items that, uh, that were sent in. Jesse Ross case is not a criminal case. The missing person's case is not considered criminal. When you're investigating a missing person's case, there's certain restrictions that you have to not just legally but ethically do. DNA, physical identifiers, they were in all respective databases. The manpower, the resources that were dedicated was extraordinary. But a lot of emotions too amongst the detectives work in the case. They don't like to come back and say, we don't know. Nineteen eighty two. Trisha Kellett is a nine year old girl born and raised in Chicago who was uh, abducted and never found. She's a little red haired girl with freckles. She looked at Jesse Ross. You see that stand out happen in the two pictures. I retired in 2010, and um, those are the two cases that I walked out of there with, back of my head, and they stayed there. I'd like to see the day when it could be resolved, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. Ten, twelve steps, and I, you know, we have no idea what happened after that. Could have gone anywhere from there. Anywhere. 
the possibilities are so vast. If there was more information about where he went after he left the hotel, as opposed to walking out the door and just disappearing, it might be easier to formulate some sort of theory about what happened. I don't really know a timeline for sure uh, because I haven't been able to see the evidence that they have on when the last communication with the cell phone towers was versus when he left the hotel. Um, but I mean, you know, if he left on his own, he could have thrown his phone in the water. Um, if he fell in, obviously he would have gotten wet. If he, uh, if he was mugged and something happened, you know, and he was hurt, um, you know, they probably would have taken his wallet and his other stuff out and thrown it in the river. But uh, there's just no way to know. There's literally no trace. You're never as safe as you think you are. My dream was to be a lawyer. I was pre-law at the time. The law you in was kind of an easy fit for me. You got to feel as an adult. Very trustworthy. You could like leave your wallet with them and you know all of your money would be like. That particular night, when I saw him the last time, it probably has to be in between the hours of 2 or 3 a.m. And I just remember when I was coming back from the restroom and saw him walking down the hallway, I just remember his um, body there right now. So it's each, his eyes were red. I mean, he was inebriated. We all were slightly tested. He said he had to like step outside for a minute. If he needed some fresh air, but he'd be right back inside. So I just was kind of like, okay. You know, you just kind of let him do his thing and you keep walking. What happened when he walked out of the store? He may have either thought the day before or an earlier time. I've seen the videotape, every video camera, every tape, and no one even stepped out to smoke. There was no one. I mean, here we are. I want to know what happened. I want to know what I could have done to help save this kid's life. And unfortunately, the cameras are the only thing to come both me. the radio station. I didn't even listen to it. I always told him I would. That's one thing that I wish I could have done. I, I wasn't thinking he was going to disappear, so I, I was planning on listening to it, to it eventually. Yeah, I, that's, uh, it's kind of hard being like somebody knows him really well and you're the last person to see him. It seems like he kind of fell off the face of the earth, and so that kind of makes it seem like he doesn't want anybody to find him. Like, it's intentional. Like, he like he decided that, you know, I don't really want to be here. I want to create my own life with new people, with nobody knowing me or whatever, and forgetting this life or something. I think we all felt really guilty because the night before we all turned together and gone to the party together and then we had split up. What were we thinking? 
I don't know. I don't remember a whole lot from that time. I just remember, like, actively avoiding all things the whole year. And, like, anyone who had been on that trip, we just wouldn't talk about it. Like, it became a thing that we just, like, pretended it hadn't happened. Like, we just wouldn't talk about it to each other anymore. And kind of, it's very weird how we all dealt with it. I won't lie to you, I went through a pretty severe bout of depression. I lost a lot of weight. I couldn't sleep. And at that point, I just say, okay, I'm moving on. I can't do this anymore. I'm not gonna, I, and I'm not going to. And so I didn't renew my contract and uh, did not go back. I still stuck with Model UN for the year. When the question came into, would I be willing to do it for another year, I said no. I remember the very last conversation I had with Ralph. We were at the gym and I was on the track and I caught him. And I was just like, Ralph, what are you up to? And he was just saying, I was like, oh, everything's great. He was telling me about his, you know, how he was finishing up his degree, what his plans were, because he was like a never ending senior. He was just telling me about that. And he was just like, you know, we should hang out sometime. It's really good to see you. Um, and that was the very last time I ever saw him. I kept thinking about that moment because what a great husband that guy could have been or what a great father he could have been and, you know, what a great educator he could have been. You know, all these things he wanted to do in life, he could have been really, really good at. And then he, he, they're both so young. We've got a couple that's a very dear friend of ours. They lost their son when he was 21 in a car accident. They visit his grave, they cry, release balloons, you know, like on his birthday, on the anniversary of his death, you know, all that things. Russes have nothing. Four oh five three zero zero six. That was his number. There was more than a time or two that I would call that number, and Don would pick up because he was, you know, he that was his phone number that he adopted. Kept that for a good long time, hoping that they'd get a, a phone call on that. The new normal, we talk about the new normal. The new normal, there's no Jesse in it. Family's not quite as uh, close. So a lot of the families, their kids grew up with Jesse, haven't spoken to us. Something like this could happen to one of their kids and uh, it's just hard to deal with. Uh, 
a mother suffers differently than a father, I suspect. And I don't know how I would know that. We were uh, building him a bedroom downstairs. It was built before he left. So I had a KU poster. We went and we matched the red and the blue paint for his room. And yeah, we told him that we had gotten the paint for his room. So he was all excited about that too. Just ecstatic. I think he always wanted to um, impress or make me happy. Jesse really had a heart and it's like he just vanished. And people just don't vanish and somebody has answers. How on earth could this happen? How can this happen? They told us the currents washed him out in the ocean and that we'll never know where he is. And we should accept that. Never. I said, if that's your idea, I said, we'll never accept it. Even if he did, I said, then you need to get busy and find him out in the ocean. We will not accept not knowing. You have so many dreams. I dream of Jesse all the time, and it's so real. And people tell you, well, you should feel lucky that you still have those images. And, you know, you have, you do still see his face and all. Suddenly you wake up and you thought that he had come home. You thought he was here. And nightmare starts when you wake up because you realize you were just dreaming and you're still where you were. <laughs> 